and welcome to another episode of the Turn Up For What podcast, talking your Houston Texans straight from the Great British Hills. We've not been back for a number of weeks. Um, we've got a new coach to talk about, your former 33rd overall pick of the draft. Number 59 is your new head coach, D'Amico Ryans. We've got what can only be described as perhaps the pinnacle of Houston sports media. Joining us, Mr. Brandon K. Scott. Brandon, how you doing? That's very kind of you. I appreciate it. I'm doing pretty good. Glad to be here, man. And yeah, these are good times, man. I mean, I, I've been talking to some of my colleagues here at 16 about how it just, it feels like, you know, one of the few times where it's positive, you know, one of the few um, the, uh, occasions where we're coming together in an off season and one of the viral moments is a positive moment. You know, and, and, and we're just talking about the early stages of it, obviously. You know, they've got to prove everything on the football field. But, you know, these are good times around here, man. Yeah, I think it's, well, it's strange. I think watching back the media availability, and it was obviously fanfare and ex-players, current players, anyone that's had any mild association in the media um, was there. And it, it kind of felt, it was... It was almost a bit emotional. I watched it on my on my commute to work on the day after. It was on a bit later here. I'm not up the, not up as late these days um, in the new world. But yeah, I think it was it was strange. It was like watching a, a something like a you know almost had the the feeling of like a like a christening or a funeral or a a wedding or something. It was like a real milestone in it, and it felt everything felt so different. And I found it hard to almost not be emotional about it, if I'm honest, because it. It just felt like all of a sudden everything was kind of normal. Like, that's what a head coach should look like. That's what a head coach should sound like. That's what the, the, everybody should react to when you hire a new coach, not what the hell's this guy or who the hell's this guy or why is he here or why is this happened like this? There's obviously more to it. And I think all of a sudden all the all the shit that we've all been through in the last three years now, um, it almost felt like all that didn't matter and you only you, there was only one place and that was to look ahead. Yeah, I think it also benefited the Texans that the person that was available and the one of the hottest candidates and one of the best candidates out there was somebody that had a direct tie and connection to the franchise. Like, I even talked to Nick Casario about this kind of on the side before the press conference started that they are fortunate in the timing of all of this, how kind of, you know, it's a cliche to say it, but like stars align or however you want to look perfect storm perfect uh sort of timing element there of the texans needed a head coach and D'Amico ryan's felt himself ready to be a head coach and just happens to be one of the better candidates on the market and someone with direct ties to the organization and the significance of that is that's somebody that's able to look through or perhaps look past some of the nonsense that has been associated with them and that's not to to invalidate it or to say that it's not significant, but to say that being here and being in this place means a little bit more than just, hey, question marks about the dysfunction. It's about, hey, you know, the the difference in D'Amico Ryan's perspective is, hey, I actually want to go fix that. I want to be part of the solution and not just disassociate myself and say, hey, that's that's something that I don't want to be a part of, which is what a lot of the the outside narrative was, was looking at the Texans and what they had going on and saying, hey, why would why would any coach, regardless of race, why would any coach want to be a part of that? And then, of course, why especially would a black coach want to be a part of that? Whereas D'Amico Ryan just did not look at it that way. He did not be with that way because Houston is home. It's where he started his career. It's where, he, you know, his wife is from. He's 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 a part of the community here. And if it were to be a success story for him, it, you know, this would be sort of an ideal place for him to 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 blossom as a as a coach so so it, it it was it was fortunate i think for the texans that the the right candidate also happened to to have a particular affection for what they had going on like in terms of community location and, and the and the, even the franchise itself given the fact that he played there and was a significant player for them yeah and i think i'm always a believer you make your own luck right i think but for the way it fell, like you said there, like for there only be five openings, for the best, you know, in quote quotations, best candidate on the market to be a former star rookie, defensive rookie of the year for you, to be a guy who 
was building a house in your city to guy to actually call out the dream job and probably I mean, in fact there's a probably about it I think if you polled every single one of the candidates you spoke to them you know off off the record none of them would have said that the this was the dream job and nor should it be because there's still a hell of a lot of work to do a lot of flaws a lot of stuff to clean up um, not ideal by any stretch of the imagination and arguably better than some of the jobs but again it all comes down to perception and the perception was that this place was not this was where careers went to die or guys guys got a job that should have perhaps be anywhere near this league or even be anywhere near a head coach level and that's what we've seen over the last two years so to get to this point of having everything in your favour kind of seems surreal I think in some sense and you were at the press conference Brandon, heard you ask a question. Um, what was it like? Talk us through it. Like, what was the whole experience like, start to finish? And then, what's the feel around town? What's what's the how much of a buzzy are you getting on a daily basis? Oh uh, man, like <laughs> the feel. So for, let me just say, the feel around town is one of like before he got the job, there was this skepticism of like. And I'll just talk about the the people that I'm around. There was the skepticism of, hey, would a does a candidate like that of that caliber want to come here? Like, th there was a a palpable feeling of, hey, we think we got a good thing going here, but does anybody from the outside really view it that way? And, and that goes back to my earlier point about D'Amico not being somebody that's from the outside. Sure, he's been gone for a while, but he's again he's part of the community and has an affection for the place. So. So there is that, and, and I think that, you know, ever since that, ever since he got the job, there's this feeling of, hey, finally somebody, and finally somebody that we can trust. You know, we we talk about this all the time, about the Texans having trust and credibility issues. You know, those are like themes when we talk about the Texans. And here is D'Amico Ryan's coming in as somebody that has all of those things immediately, like built in immediate trust and credibility in D'Amico Ryans, at least in what you know about him. Obviously, he's never been a head coach, so he still has to prove it. He still has to actually do it. But when you talk about just uh, potential and, and anybody that you could have picked that hasn't been a head coach before, D'Amico Ryans pretty much checks all the boxes. So there, there's that in terms of what the, what the feeling is. And then the press conference was interesting because we did this in, in the auditorium. It, it's where we do, I mean, we've done the press conference a couple of weeks ago with Nick Osario in the same spot where they, you know, just announced the firing of Lovey Smith, right? So we just done that. I'm sure you saw, you guys saw that too. And I mean, it was a fraction of the, of the amount of people there for that, that attended this thing. It, it was hard to get a seat in this thing. And as you know, I'm, I'm a, a regular at these things and I, I usually get pretty good seats and pretty good, you know, um, I wouldn't call them accommodations, but you know, there's only, look, there's no more than a dozen of us at a time that attend these things. Right. And, and, and you could probably extend that, you know, a dozen of 15 people that you're, that you're thinking about in the Texans media press corps. Well, you got all of those figures there in attendance plus, you know, at least 20 former players. 20 teammates, um, at least 10 current players, family, uh, members of the community. You had artists in there. Uh, I mean, it was, it was hard. Uh, point being, it was hard to get a seat. And it's the first time, and I've, I've been in that auditorium, I've been going to that auditorium on and off for, for various reasons now for about a decade. Uh, the, the college that I went to, I'm wearing it, I'm, I'm wearing their emblem right now, Sam Houston State. We play football games there. I go to that auditorium. I've seen it packed. I've seen that particular press conference auditorium room packed before. I've never seen it where it was standing room, eventually where it was standing room only, where you couldn't get a seat. You know, and I eventually got a seat, but that's how well attended this thing. I've never seen anything like that, the energy that was in that room. And I got there in time, uh, you know, to see it fill up, you know, before the room filled up and you just keep looking around and you're like, man, is that Derek Stingley? Is that King and Green? Is that is that Desmond King? You know, there, there's Brian Cushing. You know, um, it was just uh, it was just a really cool scene. You know, and uh, the, you know the, the the energy around. I, I don't I don't think that since since the Nick Casario era, I don't think there's been a moment like that. 
there, there has not been a moment like that energy wise since the Nick Casario era um, and, and this current iteration of the Texans that we've been covering. You know, you'd have you'd have to go back to when they were in playoff games, you know, when yeah. when they beat Buffalo. Uh, what is that almost that that's like three years ago now, yeah. you know, when they beat Buffalo and then, you know, obviously they lose to the Chiefs the next week, 20, you know, 24, 24 to nothing. But around since that era of Texans football, there has not been that kind of energy in a room. And I, I thought it was there was a obviously there was a marked difference in the fanfare and all the all the kind of energy that was going on around it. But I think there was a marked difference in Caserio as well. And and when you think about all the dynamics of the hire, when you think of the caliber of the candidate list that was involved, when you think of the removal of Easterby, and that moment almost seems like a domino effect in terms of the club's credibility, in terms of the type of people that want to come here. When you see how confident and genuinely cheery and, and delighted and happy in his job for the first time, it, it was Casario. And, and I read it, Brandon, as it, he, he had a spring in his step, albeit verbally, um, in front of the media, cracking jokes, making good points, in kind of the similar ways that he has done previously. But I don't know if it was just a byproduct of all the stuff that's gone before. He feel, finally feels like he's flushed it out and now he's got a fighting chance of making this a success because, you know, all the stuff he inherited knowingly and some unknowingly hindered him from ever being successful in this job. He was never going to be with his, with the cap space he had, with the terrible roster he had, with the inability to hire any hand coaches. And we're not quite a level playing field yet. I think everybody needs to kind of get their head around that. We're still not there. And I think that's the year after. Um, well into 24 but certainly the feel from Casario you, you got the impression that he felt like now I, now now's the time um it starts now you know there's there's been some little you know little lego blocks of foundations put in place um there's a hell of a lot that can go on top of those but it, it feels like the ground's been laid through a hell of a lot of pain and a lot of mediocrity and a lot of irrelevancy um, but it almost felt like the Casario either had a chance to start through time, but now he's almost been given the certification of, okay, well, he's managed to hire a genuine NFL head coach, not a placeholder, and and not even a convincing placeholder. So to go from this absolute abject irrelevancy um, and zero credit with your fan base and media and anybody that knows anything about the game to a position of relative strength, and he's still got to hire his staff, we'll come on to that, but to go from the pit, you know, from the scraping the plankton at the bottom of the seabed to popping your head up for air for the first time in three years, I think that's where Casero is coming from, and it must feel good. It feels good for the fans, and he must have a sense of relief. I think that's how I read him coming across, but what did you think about it? Yeah, so I think there is an element of relief to to the point that everything that you're saying, but I would also I would also say that there's also a level of pressure on Nick Casario mm. from from this point forward because I I don't think that he gets uh, there there's a lot in the media and there's a lot in the fan base where he kind of gets the benefit of the doubt for the circumstance that he inherited and 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 everything that surrounded that and, and a lot of that is fair, but but I also think that there is some there is some level of embarrassment. I know this for a fact. There is some level of I wouldn't I don't know if embarrassment and shame is the right word that I'm looking for, but but they don't feel good. I I can tell you from a team perspective and even from a league perspective, they don't feel good about how the how everything played out with Lovey Smith and David Cully, and 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 we can talk about it as much as we want in in terms of those being coaches that. A probably shouldn't have been hired. I mean, the, the, here's the thing about that: neither of those coaches, you could argue, should have been hired. You, or you could make a case against hiring either of those coaches. Hiring both of them makes even less sense. So the hiring and firing of them looks bad from almost any angle that you could tackle it from, even if you can see that it was not a desirable job and it was not an easy job to fill. So, you know, there, there's a little bit of nuance there. And I think there's some pressure now that, you know, there's this consensus that, you know, we're not arguing about this, right? This D'Amico Ryan's thing. 
you haven't seen anybody try to raise their hand and say, you know what? I don't think that D'Amico Ryan's guys all these cracked up to be, you know, you're not seeing a lot of that. So here's finally a hire where they've got consensus on the head coach. Okay. They got consensus on the head coach and, and seemingly the direction in which they're going as a franchise now what, and, and you have the picks, right? You can't say, Oh, he doesn't have his draft picks. Well, you've, doesn't he have he doesn't have a quarterback, but he's got draft picks and cap space to go get one, right? How, whichever avenue he wants to chase, and we can talk about that later if we want. But he doesn't have those excuses anymore. He's got all the resources at his feet. He's got the head coach pick that everybody agrees is a good hire. What now is the built-in excuse for Nick Casario to not perform or to not live up to whatever his expectation is supposed to be? So I think there is some level of relief to every point that you just made, but there's also some added pressure. And I, and I think they're okay with this, you know, like that's part of the job, but there is some added pressure now of, Hey, you've got to get this thing right. You know, uh, uh, imagine how it would feel if a year from now we're having a discussion about the Texans and where they are draft wise and talent evaluation wise. And we're having questions about, let, let's you know. Let's say they pick two players in the first round this year, as they have two picks in the first round. Yeah, and we're having questions about all four of the players that they picked in the first round of the last two years, right? Like you can you can like Kenyon Green and 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 Derek Stingley, right? But there are question marks with those two players, right? One with health, the other one perhaps with health and performance, right? And and, and I like them both as how they project for the future, but just based off of their rookie year, there are legitimate questions. What if it's the same thing, you know, a year from now? Like that, 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 that's what the pressure is. You know, you can't, yeah. you obviously can't have that. And my biggest takeaway, even before they hired D'Amico, my biggest takeaway from talking to Nick Casari or, or, or in listening to him speak in the wake of firing and Lovey Smith was, hey, he knows. I think he understands that the next time that there's a moment of calamity, the next time that the Texans feel like they need to make a drastic change because things aren't going well, it's not going to be the head coach. And that was before I knew it was going to be a beloved yeah, son. 100%. Before I knew it yeah. was going to be a, uh, a you know a franchise hero or anything like that. Before I knew it was going to be D'Amico Ryans. I, I felt like whoever it's going to be, it's going to be somebody who outlives, who 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 out survives Nick, who survives Nick Casario past the next moment of disaster or whatever it is they feel like they need to make the drastic change and fire somebody. So when you talk about relief, yeah, that's there because they feel like they can finally go, like you were saying. But there's also an added pressure of, hey, you've got to get this right now because all of the built-in excuses are out the window. I, I, I said this actually on the on the, on the, uh, on the the immediate reaction show that, it, that we did on Sports Radio 610 that one of the things, and this was before the D'Amico Ryan's press conference, but one of the Big things is that never, and this is a good point I think you made, like you think about Jack Easterby being gone and, you know, ridding yourself of a lot of the dead weight that you had within the organization. Never have the sins of the past for the Texans mattered less than they do right now in this Hmm. moment and hiring D'Amico Ryans and moving forward in this draft and in this free agency and everything. Never have the sins of the past mattered less than it does right now. And, And again, the point you mentioned about Jack. Like, I, I think that's an important point. Like, getting rid of any question, anything that could deter someone who's worthwhile, who could change the direction of your franchise from coming, got to get rid of you got You got to do away with that. And I think that they did that. That's an, maybe a an underrated move for people who don't pay attention to the team from a day-to-day basis or don't necessarily understand all of the background. But 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 that's a thing. And, and, and yeah, so so... So that, that, that's where we are with Nick Osario, like certainly some relief, but also, you know, built in excuses out of the window and, and the sins of the past don't really matter anymore. And I think I think we've got to def, uh, draw the line, I think, in two certain places, because you're right, there is the sins of the past, but there's also the sins of the present and terrible cap management and, and, and abhorrent signings in free. Well, maybe abhorrent's a bit too strict, but, but terrible signings in free agency, waste of money on Justin Britt and... Uh, Feral Brown, there's six million there. Just you could that's one you know, that's one decent free agent this season. You could have rolled that money into this year. So like and I have beat that drum and I'm still not convinced by Casario. And despite this hire, because I think I I I will come on to that in a second, because I, I think the 
you've got to question a little bit how much did Casario play in this. Okay, he liked him, but I guarantee if you gave Callan Hanna a list of all those guys, they would have gone for Domico straight away for obvious reasons. So I think you've got to you've got to also con- consider the sins of recent past, and I think they're still in play. But I think also you've also got a point where actually the the crosshairs in theory have never been f- more firmly in or have their sights on Casario because as you said if he doesn't get if he doesn't hit one home run if he doesn't get a franchise quality down and down out player out of this next four picks if he doesn't get one then there's you know he's gone I think and I think that's quite obvious ideally you know he gets three optimal four but I think he's got to hit on these picks and I think as you said right now if, if these guys may all improve and he may he may bring in a, a similar level of quality with a, the, the top 212 picks that he's got and he might enhance his roster but I think this second overall pick considering you let Lovey sabotage the thing by not firing him after the Jacksonville game it would have been the easiest thing to do thanks but no thanks you just let, let the season dissipate out into a sorry mess you get the first overall pick you didn't let that happen you, you didn't control what you control you've dropped yourself to the second pick and I think there's as much as I'm delighted with, with D'Amico and you know I remember talking with Mike Meltzer prior after the lovely fire and say I would love I would love D'Amico but I think it'll be somebody like Gannon so they've exceeded the expectations partly through good fortune but I think what happens in this draft if they get trumped by somebody jumping up like the Colts to to the number one overall spot, and you've got to watch whoever that is. If it's if it's Strout or Young, and they become somebody that that gives you Manning like misery twice a year, um, the complexion of this can change soon as you know, soon as the ball snapped week one. So, yes, it's a good move, but I think that the job in which needs to be done by the front office is bigger than it's ever had to be because now you've you've not got the kind of You've not got that shield of, well, the coaching staff aren't very great. They're not going to be here for very long. In theory, this coaching staff's here for the next three to five years. Casario's contract doesn't run another five years. So if the moves made, whether that be free agency, the draft, don't show significant progress on the roster, and I mean significant, assuming you draft a quarterback in the top two, then you don't. Now, they may shy away from that and just draft players, but that doesn't necessarily put you any further forward. So it's... It's still very precarious, I think, for Nick and the length of the contract versus your new head coach shows that, uh, but also with the number of big decisions that he's going to have to make that's going to define effectively his GM tenure because very few people get a second crack at it at a GM level. So I think, and, and, and he said that, but I think, Brandon, it can't be underrated how he has to get this right, not for himself, but for everybody, because if he doesn't, you know, then you're potentially stumbling for another couple of years and, and missing you know, those key chances to get momentum by finding cornerstone pieces on your roster. Yeah, but, but I also think that's another reason why you feel good about or a lot of fans can feel good about the D'Amico hire. You know, and I was having this discussion on the radio, like, you know, what what is D'Amico Ryan's? I think I even asked him about this. What, he's, what has he learned about, you know, front office work and, you know, what the job is of, you know, the – the people that were sitting on that stage, you know, the head coach, the front office, you know, the GM and the owner and and how all of that works because what De, what D'Amico Ryan thinks of players, what his eye for talent is, is going to matter a lot for a lot of the reasons that we just described and things that we talked about in terms of how the power dynamics have, I don't know if shifted is the right word, but how they sort of develop now in these first few years with 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 Nick Casario and and the first couple of coaching hires not going right and then here D'Amico Ryans emerges as the third coach and sort of this ideal type of candidate you know like fans can I, I feel like sort of lean into D'Amico Ryans and Nick Casario being this this pairing in the way that, and I'm not, I'm not saying that D'Amico, I'm not crowning him as Kyle Shanahan before he's ever coached a game, but in terms of the power dynamic and, and or relationship dynamic of how Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch really collaborate, like everyone really views Kyle Shanahan as the power over there, but those two guys are collaborators in, in, in a very real effective and, and, and important way. That, you know, I, I don't know if John Lynch gets a lot of credit for it because Kyle Shanahan is who he is, but I imagine that being sort of the same type of relationship, minus the cachet yet. You know, D'Amico doesn't necessarily have that as a coach yet, 
but that's what it's going to be like, you know? So it's not like it's Nick Casario on his own. And, and this is just speaking to the point of how he's got to get this right. Well, in the, in terms of the potential for him to get it right, you know, the, uh, again, going back to trust and credibility issues. Well, now you feel like he's got a trustworthy and credi- incredible partner with him and D'Amico Ryans and help him make those decisions. And so when you think about the number two pick and what to do with these first two picks in the first round, the, what is it, five picks in the first three rounds, how do they optimize this opportunity to add talent? Well, you feel good about them having somebody trustworthy in the room to make those decisions between D'Amico Ryan's yeah. and Nick Asario, that he's not on his own or he doesn't have somebody that's not necessarily qualified to be in that position chirping and in, in his ear trying to give him information, you know, uh, or, or someone with a different, like a completely different philosophy like a Lovey Smith, someone who you could argue doesn't, maybe not, doesn't have a philosophy at all in David Cully, and maybe that's not fair to him. But you understand what I mean, yeah. like, this is a totally different type of conversation we're having in terms of who's in the draft room with you and who's going to be coaching up these players. So again, speaking to these picks, like if they go, it's almost like we've all got our opinions on what we want to do with the number two pick, but now you feel good about whatever the decision that they come to, that it's at least solid and sound, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. And, and to your point about not getting the number one pick, that's huge. Like that's that is a huge thing of not being able to control your your, your not just your own destiny, but being able to control the draft entirely. Mm. Even if say you disagree with me and you don't want a quarterback at number one, you don't like any of the quarterbacks, and you want to just use that pick to to make moves and and do things. Like you don't even have that option, obviously. You know, like that is that is a a a tremendous. Uh, screw up in my opinion and I was I was furious on that final week that they didn't that they didn't lose that game you know and, and I was not not at the players but just at the yeah. people who were in charge of making sure that there wasn't a scenario where they could win that game you know whether it was firing Lovey Smith or making guys inactive that you know guys like Brandon Cooks or anybody that was worth a damn making sure that they didn't play in the game like I was furious about it but at this point, though, whatever it is that they do with number two, you got to feel good about the people that are in the room making the decisions, or at least at this point, you feel better about it. And more importantly, they'll they'll uh, re- ruin your memory of meeting Dennis Rodman as well. So that's that's not something you want to. That should have been the highlight of your day, really. And then then you got you got to <laughs> And what a weird date too of like, you know this, you know it's it's really like. The, the the Texans are playing the Colts, but in the background, it's honestly Houston versus Chicago. That's really what's happening because you're battling the Chicago Bears for the number one pick. Like you, everybody wants to lose so they can get the number one overall pick. Okay, Lovey Smith is is you know the the best coach that the Bears have had since you know Ditka, and you know he's like a kind of a a Chicago legend in his own right maybe underrated now at this point but he's the one that's standing in your way as your head coach now with something to prove knowing that he's out the door so he wants to win his last game so it's Houston versus Chicago Chicago legend standing in your way as your own head coach from from losing the game and then here I am bar hopping and walk right into another Chicago legend and Dennis Rodman sitting there holding court at a table at this bar with Dennis Rodman gear on Chicago Bulls Dennis Rodman garb all over him you know like it was like man what what is this moment right now and of course Chicago wins because the the Texans win, which means they lose. And and it was just really a mind bleep of a day, to be honest with you, even though it was kind of cool meeting Dennis Rodman. Yeah. And as I said, you can't forget the sins of present that are created by people that are still there. So I think that's whatever goes on this offseason. I think, you know, hopefully it starts to starts to form itself in, in in a way that makes us competitive on Sundays. And that's through free agency, through the draft. And uh, and I, I think yeah, and I'm on the same page as you. I think you have to draft a quarterback. You have to keep the momentum going. You, you can be a you can be a flawed roster, but but yeah, have a quarterback that can make you watchable. That can make you win games, and you can add pieces as you go. Ideally, of course, we'd all like to take you know Will Anderson, Jalen Carter this year. Take the best 
player available at 12 and go back to the well next year but ultimately when you have a chance to get one you never know when you'll be back at the table again or be in the reach of the table and it's such a gap between even first and fourth that you know you just can't take that risk and you look if you take the risk and it doesn't work out whichever way you go at quarterback and you don't win many games then you're in with a nine times out of ten you'll be in with a chance again to, to pick another one if you have to go two years back to back you trade them off for a third or whatever and uh if it's really that bad of a failure, and um, and you get to go again, so I think that I think picking the most premium position at the most premium spot is really difficult to, for me to make an argument to not do that. Um, and obviously, we've got a defensive head coach, in and I think you know, and I think he'll do the world of good for the franchise. And obviously, the, the ownership are are much more, uh, you know, happy with themselves or happy with the position it's in. I think you know, like last year. Um, made the trip over and I didn't want to go to a home game because it wasn't worth it yeah, that was that's how bad things have been I want to go now oh, yeah. I want to go this year um, because I want to see what the place should be like if it's managed in a way that gives people at least hope that's all people are asking for is hope and I think the D'Amico hire D'Amico hire does that um, on many levels I think he'll improve all these players in the defence and time will tell so there's probably not too much point of speculating on will Christian Harris be an old pro or will Stingley come alive and ask it to be more press you'd hope so I think it can't get much worse if these guys don't improve then it only undermines the whole Casario piece um, so I expect them all to improve under this coaching staff but I think that one of the biggest benefits I think of getting D'Amico is a guy who played in and coached with a Shanahan West Coast style scheme the most proven scheme to work in any situation with any players makes it and I, and I always laugh at that phrase Brandon makes it easy for the quarterback as if other oh, some systems which we have witnessed and watched and and, uh, and and let it let it die a death in front of us on the field even with a really talented quarterback of, of the of the previous departed but it's a scheme that will be worth watching on the other side of the ball and that's probably potentially be the biggest jump for us in terms of seeing things improve this year and I think that's something whoever it's Slovak or who you know or whatever the, or the other candidates that the the, the QB co- or the wide receivers coach from the Bengals whoever it is I think if they come and coach that scheme and they coach it well things will be better and even if that does mean Davis Bills for you it would still be better than where it's been yeah, it's the thing that I'm most looking forward to, if I'm honest with you. It's the aside from sort of the intangible buzz. Uh, I don't even know if I'd call that intangible. There is a there, were, there is a tangible buzz, and I think there will be more people in the stadium. You talk about even yourself wanting to go to games, and I can tell you, somebody that went to all the home games, you know, you weren't missing much. You know, you <laughs> weren't you weren't missing this epic experience or anything like that. Like you're. Your life is no uh, less fulfilled because of it. I, I can tell you that for a fact. And, and so I think that's going to be different. But, but from a football standpoint, and I know we didn't get into this a lot at the press conference, and it's not something that's been maybe discussed in depth. And you can only, I guess, discuss it but so much, but just make the point, obviously. Hey, this this offense is you know, sort of the the stylistically is sort of the premier offense that's being run right now in the NFL. You look across the league at some of the better offenses, this is what they're doing. Some of the better offensive minds in the game, this is what they're doing. This is the tree that they come from. And, I mean, and you can't help but, but figure that it's going to translate into whatever it is that the Texans are going to do and feel better about it, again, no matter what quarterback it is that they go with. It also makes me feel a lot better about the – the 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 options i should say at quarterback whether like you say if it's davis mills i think that's the the least optimal option because there is you know there are better ones i think in the draft but just better than day just better than davis mills justify drafting somebody with uh, you know a pick that high i would say no not necessarily you know you have to believe in them to a level beyond that to make that investment i i understand that you know even if even if it comes down to it, I end up disagreeing with what they do, you know, but I, I think that, you know, in this system in particular that, you know, Bry- Bryce Young would thrive in it. I think Bryce Young would thrive in any system, but I love it in this one. You know, um, I, I think that CJ Stroud is somebody that you might have question marks about, you know, I think he would thrive in this system. Now the other guys are a little bit more of projects, but I think Will Levis would thrive in this system as much as I'm not, really a Will Levis guy. 
But I look at his physical attributes and I look at how this offense sets guys up to 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 succeed who have just bare minimum type of physical tools that Will Levis has. And I think, oh man, like he is sort of him and Anthony Richardson both to a certain extent. And, and I, I look, I'm not high on drafting those guys super high. I want to be clear about this, but in terms of like how they would project in an offense like this, it it reminds me of whatever or it makes me think of whatever Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch and, and and the 49ers saw in Trey Lance, you know, a guy who was probably, you would say, just as unproven or had just as many question marks given where he was coming from, from the school that he played at and the amount of football that he played. Same type of questions with a guy like that, but you're looking at like, man, he can do this physically, and we in our offense set guys up to, to do this. You know, like, so it's like a perfect pairing, you know, um, in, in terms of like how it projects. So it, it just makes me feel a lot better about even quarterbacks who you're not completely sold on, you could sell me on them in this offense. I guess is a, the short way of saying what I'm what I'm trying to say with all of these guys, even Davis Mills, who again to me is the least uh the least optimal option of all of these guys. But obviously somebody who's on the roster is gonna be on the roster unless you, you know, cut them or, or you know, like there's there's no reason to um to to be down on the prospects of Davis Mills because he's on the roster. Worst come to worst, he's on the team. If you like Davis Mills, he'll, he'll be there, you know? So, uh, you know, ideally they're going in another direction and they're upgrading at that position. They're doing two things. They're upgrading at the position and they're upgrading schematically with what they do there, you know, uh, and, and how they put that position, uh, in, you know, in a spot to succeed, you know, or how they optimize that position, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I, I think it's I think it's fantastic. You know, I, I've been looking at or, or thinking about Slovic since, you know, since they fired Lovey Smith, you know, because I knew that D'Amico would be a candidate. And, and and I hope that this would be the type of offense that they uh, that they would that they would look at. So um, so there, there's a there's a lot of reasons to feel good. You know, I can remember these last few years, um, the all the Bill O'Brien, Tim Kelly years. And then obviously this last year with, with Lovey Smith thinking, man, you know, the, that Kubiak offense, I'd love to see it now. Like I, I, mm. I, I, I really miss it. I know how things went to hell at the end with Matt Schaub and everything, but specifically that offense again, I'd love, I'd love to see that because whatever this is that they've been doing hasn't been working. Um, well, that's but it. yeah, it, 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 to me, the big takeaway is it's got to make you feel better about whatever they do at quarterback. And and you know my big thing about D'Amico too. I know I'm rambling a little bit here, but I just these thoughts are kind of coming to me as they as we talk about this. D'Amico coming from the 49ers, okay. And I mentioned the Trey Lance thing. It seems to me that he would understand better than anybody how important it is still to get a difference maker at quarterback, to not feel like you can just plug and play anybody there because they saw the difference in San Francisco, Mm. like the difference between CJ Burthead or whatever that guy's name was and and Brock Purdy, Mm. the difference between Jimmy Garoppolo and what they projected Trey Lance to be the reason why they went out to go get him, you know, um, like it's as quarterback friendly of an offense as it is, it feels to me that D'Amico Ryan's haven't been there for what the 49ers have done over the last several years. It has been has had a first hand is a first hand witness and has had front row seats to, you know, the difference between a marginal quarterback and somebody that is a difference maker and and still needing that even within an offense like that to get to that next step here, you know, in, in this league. Like that, that's the difference, you know. So uh, you know, like the, guy, the, the teams that are in the Super Bowl right now. Jalen Hurts, you can think whatever you want to think about him. But without him playing at this level, like like if he had played rookie level Jalen Hurts, you know, the, the Eagles wouldn't be where they are right now. Like they like it's a credit to him um, and, and coaching and everything, but they still – like they, they just happen to be fortunate that Jalen Hurts has worked out. But it's not like they just plugged and played a, a guy, you know, and just yeah. got a guy – 
and were able to 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 rely on scheme alone. Like you, like the players still ultimately matter. So, um, so I, I think D'Amico Ryan's is going to be uh, is going to be very much mindful of that when they go into evaluating what they want to do at quarterback. Yeah, and Hurst is a good example. He's a Houston kid, but I think he, you know, when you watched him play, I was, was particularly impressed. I think he was more of a, a culmination of great skill positions, good scheme, fantastic run block and offensive line, balance to their play. And that's why, in theory, unless Mahomes can equalise it all uh, next, or yeah, or this Sunday coming, um, the, you know, the, the, in theory, the better all-rounded team should win. So, the, you know, I, I understand there's, there's a there is a, there is a, a balance to be sought, but ultimately, when you look at the Trey Lance example of how much they gave up, you know, at the behest of our previous pick, um, that you've got to take a chance when you get one, even if you're, you know, you might not be a hundred percent sold. You never can be in this process of lottery, but I think taking Bryce Young, I hope it is, and I hope that Chicago gets stuck and they'll get the value they want. Um, but I feel Ursi's potentially is going to throw the kitchen sink to get up there and maybe overpay uh, because he must be sick of it all. Um, doing the the veteran QB cycle, which we've had, you know, on the early O'Brien years, uh, you know, Indianapolis have just come at the end of it potentially. You know, you know, fourth overall or whatever they are, they'll, they'll be able to take somebody of the top three. So, yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately, the head coach is great and it's his thing, but ultimately it's a QB-driven league and if we've got the right offensive system with a a true leader and a strategist as your head coach, then you've got two of the biggest boxes checked. Um, so we could be sitting here, Brandon, in uh, last weekend, April, and have those boxes checked and have a nice free agency class. It might not be that simple, and there is obviously the opportunity for this not to work out. Um, what do you think of the? What do you What do you think of the chances of the realistic chances with all the stuff considered? What's the chances of this D'Amico Ryan's Rain working out. Now he's here for two years at the minimum. Um, I know we said that last year when we talked about Lovey Smith, right enough. But you got to think he's going to have three years. He's going to have three years. He's got. He's he's almost got one up on the GM, like we said. But how how does this work out? What's the path to success? Because I think ultimately twenty twenty five is ideally when you want to be competitive again. But what is it? What is it? What does a a clear path look like to success? Say if it is twenty five. Yeah, so before I go into the clear path, let me go into the less clear path and and talk about hope for a second. And I understand hope is not a strategy, okay? But <laughs> it has been, you know, <laughs> since, since we're talking, you know, you mentioned Ursay and wanting to move up to, uh, to get the number one pick. I'm hoping that Chicago. This is my hope right now, as we talk in early February, and and haven't gotten any close to to the to the draft itself. But my hope is that Chicago. The, with the identity that they have there, okay, a defensive-minded city, you know, won a Super Bowl in the 80s off of a historic defense, hired a defensive coach in Matt Eberflus, who, by the way, does have a relationship with the Colts, right? That's where mm. he came from. Well, yeah. But hired a defensive coach, uh, a former offensive lineman is their general manager in Ryan Poles. They've got the guy that they think is their franchise quarterback right now in Justin Fields. I'm hoping to death, man, that they fall in love with one of those defensive players, whether it be Will Anderson or Jalen Carter, yeah. and that they don't deal that pick. You know, And that's, that's to say nothing of the Colts' interest or any other team's interest in going to go get it. I know or, or feel like we can say pretty conf- confidently that that's going to be there. But I'm just really hoping that, you know, all of the Texans fans that I see that <laughs> want to draft Will Anderson and that want to draft Jalen Carter, I hope to death that the Bears think like them and mm. want one of those players as badly as some of those fans want those players and that the Texans sort of luck their way into Bryce Young the same way that they've, in Locked a similar the fashion, <laughs> they've lucked their way <laughs> and- into – uh, into D'Amico Ryan. You know, like, that's what I'm really hoping for. Yeah, and you know when you think of Ryan Poles, who's the GM, this is only going to be, what, year two? Is it? Yeah, yeah it's year, year, two. year two. And if you think of the pressure that's on him to make that decision right, because if you come out of that pick, you then potentially have additional asset. And look, obviously, the, the history of the first overall pick will tell you if it's, it's, it's very mixed, if not, not great. 
Um, so the less riskier move is to trade out of that, and that's obviously the worst case scenario for us. And if he does that, then it puts us, you know, it potentially this clear path that we're about to come on it, it potentially knocks that off the path. But if you think of what is the safer option for him um, in terms of the psychological risk, now the, the, the analytical risk, I think, would tell you that trading out is the optimal way to do so. But I think the... If you're in his shoes, and imagine that for a second, and you think, if I trade at this pick, and I don't get the value right, and somebody, and regardless of what the other team does with it, he'll always be judged on the guy that gave up that pick. And you don't see a lot of teams trading out the first overall pick very often, if at all, just because of the the Jimmy Johnson chart value-wise to get to justify coming out of that. Teams don't give it up. You know, the Texans, I think, came quite close to Atlanta as well documented, but Rick Smith wanted a... Uh, yeah, a king's ransom to do so. Trade never happens. You take Jadavian Clowney. Mixed career. Um, was okay for a year, but you know the turf trades at NRG potentially uh, sidetracked that a little. However, I think if you're in his position, if, it was, if I was to bet what he's going to do, I think he sits there and picks because the psychological risk of giving that up to somebody else and then you open yourself up to all levels of criticism whereas if you think of from a PR linear point of view if he stays in that pick and makes his pick whether it's a defensive player or what have you um, th there is less to be said and written and permeated about that pick and what he potentially could have done so I I hope and I'm obviously but we're obviously biased here but I, I hope that they stay in that pick and take that and take you know, a Will Anderson for a defence that probably needs it, a defence that's up front. And when you've already, you know, when you've already invested in a guy in the first round who who has got a Jalen Hurts type path to be successful with a better defence, with a better run game, with a better offensive line, then hopefully that's the outcome. Because if not, I think that puts us in a bit more murkier waters than we'd like to think now as we're kind of looking towards a potential saviour. But what do you think is this clear path then, Brendan, to to be back on a a progressive track um, to be competitive 24-25? Because this year's going to be tough. It's going to be a big jump and you will get organic growth, but you've got to remember where you started from and how, and how high that mountain is. But what, what, what does a path to you look like in terms of getting back to competitiveness and relevancy? Yeah, I, I was sitting on this earlier and just saying that I don't think anything matters more than the the evaluation of players by D'Amico Ryans. You know, like I I think his vision exactly um, and, and how it pairs with Nick Asario is what's going to be key. And, and honestly, just from this point, from this point, it's all about the player evaluation, you know, and, and the team building because we've gotten through the muck of it, you know, the, the nonsense, you know? So like the clear, the clearest path is obviously, you know, not doing, making brain dead decisions that they made before in free agency, uh, who they decided to pay and who they didn't, you know, not trading, uh, trading players, you know, you think about, uh, and it's great having Laramie Tunsil now, but you think about the, the mentality and the the sort of uh, strategic failures that went into, you know, the logic that went into even trading for Laramie Tunzel after everything that they had even done that off season, you know, like not doing things like that on the, on the player acquisition standpoint. And then like, if we're talking about trades and then obviously the Deandre Hopkins trade on the other end, it, when you're sending out a player who is, significant or a premium player you know knowing knowing not to be fleeced in a way that would that would go down as one of the worst trades in nfl history like it's like a short answer to your question would be just being good stewards of the assets that you have right now like that's yeah. the clearest path like you have an opportunity here and, and I, I I would include the the quarterback conversation in this as well like the, the way i view this entire opportunity here to pair your head coach with your franchise quarterback at a time when you have more draft picks than normal and more cap space than you've had in years, you know? And so like all of that timing wise is coming together, right? It's all coming together timing wise. And so the clearest path is, is just to be, that is, this doesn't mean that you're going to hit on everything. You know, let's not be unrealistic and mm. say that every move is going to work out. Now, the ones at the, at the, on the premium side need to, right? Like, 
we're yeah. not going to give him a pass if number two overall doesn't work out. If Derek Stingley never gets healthy or stays can stay healthy, you know, if if Kenyon Green is a bust, like we're not going to give him a pass for that. No. But for the most part, being good stewards of what's in front of you is the clear path. Like the 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 path is what you have in front of you and how you use it. So uh, so I'm I'm very interested to see how this offseason plays out because there, there have been some interesting debates already about how many games the Texans can win next year. And we don't even know what the team is going to look knows. like. Yeah. We have, we have no idea who's going to even play for them next year for the most part, which is, uh, you know, an interesting uh, discussion to have given that. But the idea is they have the opportunity to switch things drastically. Like, and, and, and that's not to make a prediction. That's just to say, yeah. Hey, if you get enough things right between the draft and the cap space and you think it were the money that you have under the cap and you factor in the D'Amico Ryan's higher and the, the schematic differences that you're going to have on both sides of the ball and how that should be so much better. Like you should look drastically different. Like the, the, the overzealous, the thought that you could win a bunch of games next year is directly tied to the idea that you're not going to look anything like you looked last year, save for a couple of pieces and pieces that you, for the most part, like, and the things that you're inserting, you at least want to feel good about. So, uh, so again, the short answer would be good stewardship, you know, being good yeah. stewards of the resources that are in front of you and spending and drafting wisely. Um, and I know that's maybe that's a very generic way of, of putting it, but I, I think that the Texans now more than more than they ever have, or at least more than they have in the last few years, have an opportunity to actually do that with few, with far mm. fewer excuses. Yeah, and I think for me, like top line, I think you take the QB because then that gives you a chance to just to be able to survive in a league that's all predicated on good offense. I think. In the absence of any, you know, I won't. I did a full draft board last year, watched hundreds of games. I won't be nowhere near that this year. I'll be reliant on. I just don't. New, new work in life has put me right out of that. So I think the 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 thing for me is what I've learned so far of the three or four draft opinions I listen to is it's heavy on edge rushers. There is no edge rushers of any note unless they get released in free agency. So if you came out with a quarterback and a guy who can rush the passer up front. I think that's a good first round. Then you've obviously got to throw multiple assets at linebacker, potentially at a wide receiver as well. Um, and whatever assets you have, you probably can't fill um, based on those positions and how you fill them and how, the type of players at those positions that get out, particularly at wide receiver where the, the values exploded. So I think if you can find a defensive imprinted player um, who can make a difference for you, um, plus a QB, I think that's a successful round one who are able to contribute and and, and and at least help you win games, if not outright win them yourself. Their um, and look, if it's the best corner on the board at 12, let's get two really good corners. You know, if it's ideally you want to invest in the trenches and that's obviously will take the pre premium aspect. But I always think unless it's a transcendent talent and a clear top one or two players at that position, you always go defense in the first round because ultimately for me, defense is just about stacking talent on talent on talent. You can't have enough of it. Um, and then it's just about Hopefully you're lucky enough in the same ways that you were with Damian Pearson to a degree, Jalen Petrie. Still want to see him clean up the tackle and all that kind of stuff. And to a degree, Christian Harris. If you can find three or four guys of the same level of them that you can see a clear progression to, and hopefully that progression is then accelerated by a far superior coaching staff, then I think things start to look a lot rosier very quickly. But nothing looks rosier more when you've got the centrepiece and that's a quarterback. So whatever they do at that spot, it feels like that's the inflection point for the next two to three years potentially because you're all going well you're not going to be number three number two back to back ever again you might be one more year but you know it might be a rocket situation you take a couple of high picks and you're still down there um so that could happen and maybe that's the ideal and maybe you have to sit through a kind of trying but testing season but yet you can see the the green shoots emerging for later years but i think this second overall pick which should have been the first I think that's still got a bit to play out. Despite the D'Amico hire, delighted, exceeded my expectations beyond the, what a wildest 
Optimus could have said, I think, at the start of the season, you have a bona fide leader who has a resonance with the fan base in the city, um, who wants to be here for the first time in a long time. Bill O'Brien didn't even want to be here in his later years, openly talked about getting fired, and he's maybe thinking he's sitting pretty back in New England to take over Bilicic at some point. But I think it's this Pep brand that I think that is just, I, I, until that happens, it's hard to know exactly what path we're on. Yeah, so for me, I'm quarterback number two and just unequivocal about it, okay? So be, and, and it's because, it, and that's my opinion. I'm obviously open to discussion and disagreement on this, right? Like, and and there's plenty of it. But for me, I, I just happen to believe that Bryce Young is the guy. And I think, like, I think he's a franchise quarterback, you know, despite the, the questions about his size. C.J. Stroud, I think, is has the potential to be above average. I'm not as high on him, but for what I think he can be, I think he is worth the number two pick. I would pick C.J. Mm. Stroud. So I, yeah. I actually think that they are in a good position to get a quarterback. And now it would be very interesting to me if they ended up going Will Levis because that would tell me a lot about what they think about him. Mm. But I, I think it's really important. I mean, obviously, I would say a lot of what they think about him picking him number two overall. But I think that it, it is a no-brainer to go quarterback here and not just because they need quarterback, because but it's because I truly believe that the quarterback is there. Hmm. Not just taking a swing at it. And I'm actually I, I'm actually okay with like being wrong as long as you felt good about it at the time and, and you know and not doing revisionist history. Like we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna feel good about it, obviously, but like like I can say with conviction that I think that these that these two guys are worth being selected number two overall. So I think you go that route. You do that. Back to the point that I was making earlier about D'Amico Ryan's having firsthand knowledge about the difference between having just a guy and then someone who can be a difference maker for you, even in a system like this that he's probably going to be bringing here to Houston or you know to the Texans. So I, I think that's an obvious one. I, I, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even consider personally, and this is just me talking, but I wouldn't even consider going anywhere else with number two other than quarterback because there's two there's two that I think that 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 are possible or could be available yeah. to you. Not to mention the fact that the scenario we just mentioned could possibly play out with with the uh, with the with the Bears falling in love with a defensive player and possibly selecting one, and Bryce Young still being there, or even the Colts jumping up. And you can find mocks that look like this as well. The Colts jumping up to number one, but still selecting C.J. Stroud, you know, and, and possibly having some questions about Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud, you know, being someone that fits the profile more so from a size standpoint and them going in that direction and Bryce Young still being available to you at number two. Bottom line is, I think no matter which quarterback is there at number two, that they should pick that guy because that guy is good enough to pick at that spot. Um, so that's an obvious one for me. Now, where I would disagree a little bit on the second pick is, and, and this is a credit to D'Amico Ryans and his coaching and some of the stories that we've heard about him and helping develop guys like, like, uh, like Fred Warner and and some of the other guys on that, uh, you know, on that San Francisco 49ers defense. But I feel better about picking defensive players in later rounds. And it doesn't have to be like super late in the draft. Mm. It can be second, third running. They got two third round picks right now. And not to say that they're going to get the you know a premium pass rusher in the third round or anything, but I feel better about the defensive players that they'll end up drafting in the later rounds because they have D'Amico Ryan's because they have a defensive coach, and and it makes me because the the offense was so bereft of uh, of talent, so, so desperate for uh, for weapons last year. You know their best receivers at times out there were Chris Moore and Philip Dorsett. You know, when Brandon Cooks and, and Nico Collins couldn't play and the fact that Brandon Cooks and Nico Collins are your best receivers anyway, like yeah. to me, it's an opportunity to go and get a Quentin Johnston or if you like Jordan Addison, I'm higher on Quentin Johnston out of TCU uh, because he, he he sort of reminds me of the he's the he's the the yards after catching yards after contact type of player that fits into uh, what you would see in in, in what yeah. they were doing in San Francisco, right? Like he he to me fits that profile, that type of guy, and to me would just fit perfectly. And, and I liked him anyway, even before I thought they or knew that they were hiring D'Amico Ryan's. But go and get that weapon to me. P 
pair your quarterback, your franchise quarterback, with a franchise caliber weapon and and go from there. And and, and free agency, I think there are, you know, between free agency and uh later in the draft, um, I, I think you can address some of the some of the issues on defense, but you know, I think about what they've already done there in selecting a, a cornerback at number three overall last year. And you can have your questions about that, but they took a corner at number three overall last year. They've got a safety they drafted in the second round that, you know, if he can figure out some of those tackling issues, has potential to be a Pro Bowl level All Pro player, like if put in the right position. You know, and again, he's got to fix a lot of that tackling stuff, but the potential is there. The linebacker, Christian Harris, somebody that they you know, that they've invested in and think a lot of um, and, and now is going to be paired with a former linebacker as his head and former linebackers coach as his head coach. You know, to me, I trust whatever they do with, uh, you know, with their defensive talent evaluation and would prefer that they spend some of those premium picks, at least this year, to start on some offensive talent and uh, and get this offense rolling because you can't try it out what you ha- you can't try it out mm. there what you've had the last couple of years yeah. and the fact that Brandon Cooks has been your number one receiver for the last three years that should not be the case. No, I agree, Principal Brendan. Absolutely, I think you do need that. But I think just in terms of supply and demand of guys that are there, I think I don't think they may perhaps may not view them as justifying that twelfth spot. But look, trade back out of that and get you know a couple of seconds out of it or what have you, and um, and then it gives you multiple chances to go at it because I think yeah, ultimately. There's only so many holes you can plug, but um, but it all matters again, and this is the best bit about it. It actually feels like it's worth a damn. And last season didn't even do pods the last the end of the season. Just let it play out. Couldn't wait for it to be over. But now, you know, it all seemed th- things that were never even remotely close to being in play now kind of feel like they're getting close, and it, it could actually mean something. Um, and I can't wait to go back to NRG now to see what it's going to be like because people want to be there all of a sudden, just like I do. And uh, that's exciting, and I think that's that's where where we've we've had to do our time now, and I'm hoping just like the D'Amico hire all lined up nicely, then hopefully there's some more good fortune in store because I think we're due it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It's, again, as somebody that spent a lot of time at the stadium and just could, and and as somebody that's been there when things were going well, you know, it's a it's just such a stark contrast uh, in terms of energy, you know, and, you know, at the, at the very least, you know, I, you know, I think it was harder to have patience with the David Cully year and with the Lovey Smith year, because you knew it was the path to nowhere. Yeah. You knew that it was, that there was no potential in it. And, you know, as much as you want to be fair to someone, and as much as you might want to give them the opportunity to grow, like the, the the way we do with the players, you're like, okay, let's give Davis Mills a chance. Okay, mm-hmm. let's let Christian Harris get, you know, get his wits about him. Let's let Derek Stingley, you know, do the same as somebody that hasn't played a lot of, you know, as much football ideally in the last couple of years. Like, yeah. but you see the potential there and you're like, okay, let's have patience with this. Yeah. But the last couple of head coaches, fair or unfair, and probably more fair than unfair because you knew that there was no, it was a path to nowhere. You didn't have that patience with it either. You're like, man, okay, not only does this look terrible, but there's not even a reason to feel like this is going to get better or we should be like, we should be invested in the experiment Yeah, because this is not, this is not for long. And at the very least with the Miko Ryan's, I think that we will be and probably should be more willing to to experience and go through whatever growing pains exist, whatever gripes we might have week to week. Uh, mm. Once this thing gets rolling, I think it's a, a something that we'll be more willing to and and should be more willing to endure. And and that I think is going is is a, alone a part of the intrigue or an element of the intrigue of, hey, we're here we're here to kind of see this thing through. Even if, even if, and when some frustration factors into all yeah. of it, and, and so, uh, you know, we talk about the the energy at the press conference and the buzz around town and the hope and all of that. Like all of that, I think is palpable, and and it's something that you're going to be able to apply to this next season and probably even the season after that, as you go into this D'Amico Ryan's era. Plus, with all of these new players that you're going to be acquiring one way or another. Yeah. 
Well, long may it continue. Thank you very much for Brandon for his time. Thank you for listening. And sorry we're not being back, but I said we're only going to do this and needs must this off season, and we'll work out what the plan is here and after as life kind of changes a little bit on my end. But thanks to Brandon Scott. Thanks for your time. Thank you for listening to Turn for What Podcast. Like, share, do all that good stuff. And we'll be back hopefully to talk about free agency and a little bit of draft. But uh, thanks again and speak to you soon.